Okay, so uh, some of you may recall that um, at the end of class last time, we were talking about a type of trouble that comes up, well, in general, for last lecture, we were talking about testing challenges and needs with object-oriented programs. What were some of the challenges that we mentioned? Anyone remember? Uh, subtyping. Yeah, subtyping is a, a big one. And in fact, not just subtyping in general, although we'll come back to the challenges associated with that, but sub classing, classing as a specific subtype of subtyping. You can have subtyping going on between, say, a class and a, and a uh, interface in Java. And that's not something which has inheritance, but it, it has its own promise implications. It's implications for the needs for the promises of those two to be consistent. But subclassing brings, in addition to subtyping, which is a relationship of contracts, of promises, subclassing brings inheritance. An inheritance of what? Of the functions. The functions, yeah, the methods. And what else? What else do you inherit? If you base one class on another, yeah, the instance variables within those. In short, implementation, sorry, inheritance of implementations. Hmm? There's a, there are some other challenges that we talked about as well. For example, the, the, you have encapsulation. A class has these private things which outside things can't see. So if you have a class, a, a test outside of that class, it can't see if the class, the instance of the class is in a sane state. The thing called the yo-yo problem we'll come back to and so on. But a lot of what we, we, we emphasized last time was challenges associated with subtyping and subclassing. And I really want to drive those home because there seem to be some confusions about those associated with subtyping. So I actually took the step of adding a lot of a lecture for the later part of this lecture as time allows to hit on the issue of subtyping. But I noted that beyond the subtyping relationships, subtyping guarantees that are required as of a subclass, there were other challenges as well. And one is that a superclass can break a subclass. Not only that, could a subclass break a superclass? Yes, by overriding methods in, the, in an inappropriate way, it could break superclasses behavior. And we're going to see a concrete example of that with which I left you at the close of our last session. Okay, um, and one of the points I made last time is that when you're dealing with subtype relationships, that A can be passed around as a B. Remember that? That requires some consistency what A promises in terms of what B promises. A has to be consistent with, the subclass has to be, cons instances of the subclass have to be consistent with what's promised for instances of the superclass. Why is that? Intuitively. Because they can act as one? Yeah, they can be passed around as if they are an instance of a superclass. So someone doesn't know it's a subclass that's been passed, and all they know is it's a, it's a collection. And so it has to behave consistent with any collection. It may be a hash set, a, a Jesse's hash set that was passed in. And that sure as heck has got to behave in a way consistent with the collection, which is all the person who has it knows that it is. They don't know it's a Jesse's hash set, as virtuous as that class is. But when we're dealing, and we're, we'll come back to what the needs are there, but when we're dealing with subclasses, it turns out there's additional sorts of information that if we're going to base a cl one class on a subclass as a subclass of another, if we're going to have it inherit the implementation of a superclass, I argued last time that it needs additional information. Now, what sort of additional information does it need? Give me an example. The types of functions it uses. 
okay, I, I, I like that, and I'm going to try to make it more mechanistic. What calls what? Yeah, like the, the blockchain. Yeah. So do you remember this? Yeah. Do you remember this issue that we have, um, we had two, 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 uh, uh, we had a class, and then we had a subclass over here on the right. The class is on the left, the subclass is on the right. And one of the questions was, well, you know, will this subclass work properly? And the answer proffered last time was what? The answer was, it depends on how the superclass works. Yeah, exactly. And what particular thing on how the superclass works um, is, is very important. Yeah. Does is prime do what? Call get value. Yeah, if, it, if is prime calls get value, we're off to the races. We've overridden get value. We know is prime calls it. So we have to, so the fact that we've overridden get value um, will automatically mean that is prime will use the new get value from the new, for the subclass, right? Yeah. Now, I said we're off to the races as it works right now in that case, and I'll come back to that. But suppose is prime does not call get value. It just directly accesses the value within this class, some, some um, field, some, some variable within this class. W will it work? No. No, because it's, it's, it's accessing the, the value for the superclass. It's not accessing the value in the subclass. Is value current, right? So whether or not this will work in the first place is up in the air, depends does is prime, Mo and Tone did earlier, call get value. Mm -hmm. But there's a deeper concern here. Okay, suppose it does call get value. Suppose we go look at the code for this superclass, which was written by somewhere else, someone else, you know, at some other place, and we confirm it does call get value. We decompile the code and we see it calls get value. Are we all set? Is it safe? to just say, well, it calls get value, so we'll implement the class here on the right. No. Why not? What could happen? It could change. It could change. So someone in a fit of optimization or whatever could have his prime no longer call get value. They could instead directly manipulate whatever the instance field is here on the, for that superclass, in which case that future version of that superclass, would it work with our class? No. no. So in the future, it, could, it might not call it. So we're, we're not protected. OK. But I left you with this example. Some of you may remember it. Although with your 360 study going on, it may seem to be from another galaxy in a time far, far away. Is this an acceptable subclass? Is the subclass on the right an acceptable subclass of the superclass on the left? So we on the left have a hash set. It allows us to add things into it one by one. It allows us to add things into it in a collection of things at once and to get a count of the number of things in it, right? Um, uh, to count up the number of things. Now, uh, this... Um, now this thing on uh, so that get count just returns the number of things that are that are in the in the set. Um, and actually, I should uh, there's there's actually uh, I, I'm sorry. I this is actually a poor example. I should even have this is not needed. It will distract things. Okay. So suppose we have this. You have add and add all. Now on the right, suppose we want to take a, create a subclass of this, and all we want to do is add a little bit of functionality. Specifically, we want to record how many times we've added things into this class. What's the count of times we've added things into the class, okay? okay. Um, so we may, you know, we may uh, start with uh, some, some elements, but how many times have we called that? Hmm? So we want to have this get add count. We, it just returns some add count. And what do you think we have to do to add count to have this work properly? Okay. Yeah, we have to increment it every time we've added things, right? Now, what I, I want to ask here is, do you think, let's look at how these work. 
So add, all it is is a wrapper for the add here, right? All it does is it increments this add count and then it calls off to this add. Do you see that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All it does is delegate off. Say, hey, now you do your work. Add all, similarly. It just adds the number of things here to the number that have been added in and it calls off to add all in the superclass. And add count just returns the number of things added. And what I'd ask is, is this class on the right safe? Is it correct? No, it's not. Okay, so give me, a, give me an argument for it's not, it's not safe. Um, I think the problem is in the add-on function in the subclass. Okay. Because um, um, uh -huh. the problem is in, after it adds the count, yep. it calls the super class add-on function. Good. Which, um, which if the add-on function from the super class implements the add function iteratively okay. it's going to be a problem because the subclass is going to override that with the add count oh. plus plus. Okay, so I like what Jay's saying. He's bang on. Let me see if I can unpack it into other words. So suppose we have this as, uh, as a subclass and we have an instance of this subclass. We call add all on it, right? With, with a collection, say, of three things. Hmm? So add count is going to be incremented by what? Three immediately. Then we call add all up in the super class. Now suppose, as Jay said, the super class add all calls add. Whose add is it going to call? The subclass. Subclasses, because this thing is overridden. Yeah. So this thing is going to be using the most specific add that's been defined, which is this guy. And he's going to call it three times, one for each of the items. And so it's going to add six to it. Okay, now that's disconcerting, that possibility. Suppose we were to say, well, we'll just punt on this. Let's, let's rip out this add count out of add all. We'll just have a delegate to add all. Is that a solution? Not if they don't use add. And yeah, add maybe add all doesn't call add. Maybe it just does the ads internally, in which case, now, if this thing doesn't call add, and we call this with a collection of three elements, what's going to happen? If we've removed this add count, it's not going to add anything, it's not going to add anything and it's going to miss that. So, is this correct? Well, it, it depends, right? We don't know if it's correct depending on, let me get rid of this, this, this thing here, okay. Um, um, we don't know if it's going to work. It, whether it's going to work right now depends on whether add all calls add. Suppose we secretly know whether add all calls add and we hard code that assumption into how we do things. Is it safe? For now. For the moment? Until what happens? Superclass changes. The superclass changes, in which case it breaks ours. Now imagine that this superclass was created by someone else. Imagine it was created by Oracle, the folks who build the Java libraries. Are they gonna know, oh, to call up Mo, hey, it's gonna break your class, your instrumented hash sets. That's a nice class you got there, boy, but oh, we're gonna be breaking it. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna be breaking your class. You better fix it. Will they do that? No, they don't even know the existence of the super subclasses. They don't know that someone's counting on this. And what the heck, they, they go to optimize things and add all no longer calls add. And suddenly they've broken all these subclasses they don't even know existed, right? And they don't tell, they don't, they don't mention it to people. Um, so we could have serious problems. So look, depending on superclass code is not a viable solution. And the issue is not just how it currently works, but how it will evolve in the future. And what we need here, ladies and gentlemen, is, is something we can rely on. We need a contract. We need a promise by the superclass how it's going to work. A promise in terms of what calls what. Does add all call add or not? If it does call add, we know that we don't have to add this thing in because of we calling our add. 
If it doesn't call ad, and we know that it will not call ad from now on, we've got to have this thing in there. Mm -hmm. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for a, a contract. And in 470, when I've taught that class, unfortunately I don't right now, I've emphasized ways of giving these contracts. But basically, it's something that appears in Java libraries, you'll see. For this reason, in Java libraries, for certain classes that are subclassable, that are designed for subclasses, you will see them document this calls this. So that you're clear, if you override something in a subclass of that class, whether it might call your subclass. Yes, mom. In, in like the real world, does Oracle ever actually like break their superclasses? Almost never. Almost never, right? They try to avoid it at all costs because yeah. they could cause countless problems. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I don't know of any case where they've broken them. Yeah. What I do know is what they'll generally do, and they do this in spades, instead of changing the behavior of an existing class, say a superclass, in a way to make it better, they'll add another class that can do similar things that you can use separately that's, that's much better. An example is date. The date class was introduced in maybe the first version of Java. It's frankly a, a very poor class. It, it, it's poorly designed. It's mutable among other things. So if you have a class that contains a date, a reference to a date, and you accidentally give out that reference, someone can change it. Change it from what your what date you have pointed to internally. It's just asking for trouble. And so in more recent versions, I think it's Java 8, they rolled out a much better solution for dates. And would they do that by just creating uh, an overload? Or they just add like another parameter or something? No, they did it by rolling out a new class a whole entirely. New class. Whole new class. Whole new class. That that is immutable. Immutable. It's not changeable. Okay. Yeah. Um it's a big issue. Um, it's an issue that goes back a long time. Another example of this is the Windows API, which, you know, 10 years ago was a much bigger, more universal concern than it is, or much more common concern than it is now, but it's still an issue. And Microsoft would try very hard not to break the Windows API by changing things that other code is counting on. Okay? Um, Okay, so um, so that's that subclassing is a serious issue. Um, let's talk about additional challenges. Well, one is, look, when we have so so here hash set, an instance of hash set uses functionality here. After all, we're calling this functionality over here. In principle, when we test things. When we test class A and it uses class B, we'd like to have the option of mocking out class B. So we can test A in isolation. We can test A in a really nice way. For example, maybe B is a class that reaches over, over endpoints on the web to grab some data from the server. And every time we test class A, we don't want it going out and reaching over the network. And so we mock out that component and all we do is we confirm that it is calling it and we have it return a placeholder value consisting of the face of Taylor Swift, right? Um, and then we don't have to worry that it has to all be set up to go over, over the, 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 um, the web. Um, so we'd like to mock things out. What's the problem with mocking here this class um, based on things that it uses. I mean, after all, it uses this. Why can't we mock it? Because it inherits it. Yeah, it inherits it. There, there ain't no way currently that you can mock something from which it inherits. You, ju you just can't do it. Does this use this? Oh, you bet it uses it. It uses these functions. Can we mock these functions out? No. The mocking technology does not allow us to do that. So that's another barrier with object-oriented testing. We can't mock things out 
that are in superclasses. It's they're not mockable. Okay. Um, so as a result, essentially we're required to do we're integration testing. When we test this, we're also testing this. And we'd better make sure we test all these methods because they could be called. Could imagine this had a whole swack of other methods that we didn't override. Ten of them, say. Could they be called in an instrumented F set? Yeah, they could be. So we better test them as well on instances of this, of instrumented F sets, okay? Now, we talked about the Yodu problem last time, but fundamentally it's illustrated here, right? We call add at all here. It ends up calling at all here which ends up calling add here, potentially, mm -hmm. which ends up calling add here. So we're going back and forth, yo-yoing between these different classes. Sometimes we're executing code here, sometimes we're executing code there. It's messy, it's delocalized. We're, we don't have all the code in one place. It's kind of zigzagging between these different contexts where these contexts were written without knowing about this code at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's the yo-yo problem. It can bounce It can bounce up and down the inheritance hierarchy um, uh, uh, as, it, as we're calling. Okay. So the generally accepted way to do this is, look, if you're going to encourage subclassing with respect to your class, create subclassing interfaces. Basically what these say is, for example, what calls what. But also, going back to an example we saw earlier, do you remember this? What's the problem with this? Suppose, is this a problem with what calls what? That if, if we knew what calls what from this guy, we'd be fine? Suppose, this is our superclass, and all we do is we override set value. Do you think this subclass will work? Why won't it work? Because the value is actually in the subclass. Yeah, the value is set in the subclass, and what's gonna what's it gonna break almost inevitably? The get value, get value and, and almost certainly is prime too. Regardless of whether it calls get value or not, it's gonna break it. Yeah. So this is not a problem with what calls what. This is a problem with what things have to be overridden together. We need to provide both of these together at least, and maybe all three of these, for it to be safe. So there's actually two types of information that are very valuable in subclass contracts. One are what calls what, among the things related to the things that are overridden. And second of all, what things have to be overridden together. It doesn't make sense to just do this. It kind of has to be done with this and maybe with this prime as well. Does that make sense? Mm. The Greek chorus is quiet today, but I'll take that as a scent. Okay, so, so you wanna plan for subclassing. There are these tools called class flatteners that basically allow you to sort of look, what are all the methods in a class so I can test them all, uh, for example. Um, and generally you want to test for subtyping, uh, for, sub, uh, for subclassing especially carefully. You want to test for subtyping that does do instances of a subclass <laughs> adhere to all the promises made for the superclass, the contracts made for the superclass, contracts that I am looking forward to seeing in ID3. Mm. Noted. Um, but you also want to run unit tests for the superclass, even if you've only changed the subclass. Why might you test the superclass, for example, um, superclass uh, uh, superclass methods if you only um, changed uh, a method that's that's in the subclass? Why might you call the methods that are defined in the superclass on an instance of that subclass, even though you've only changed the subclass? 
Yeah, so, so those methods are actually supported by the subclass, so they have to be tested. It's claiming to be able to deliver them, so they gotta be tested. Um, so you test a mixture of subclass and superclass functionality. Um, overridden methods, you're gonna wanna test really, really heavily. Um, and if you change superclasses, ideally you should change uh, all implement, uh, you should test implemented subclasses. Why is this a problem for something like Oracle? If we change the superclass, let's test all the subclasses. It's a huge library. Yeah, it's like tens of millions of subclasses out there that have been created off of java.object. You're gonna go test those? Ain't gonna happen, it ain't gonna happen. But if you're doing development in-house, yeah, you could you could do something like that, right? Um, I mentioned proper initialization of superclasses. What what's so special about initialization of superclasses? Why do I mention that as a specific risk? Where is initialization going on here? Yeah, what is it? What is this doing? It's just calling the, the maintains s, I think. Yeah, so so it is actually taking a collection in, and then it's delegating it over here to the hash to the constructor of the hash set. And if you forget to do this, what bad thing could happen? Well, it could be that this isn't properly initialized. The superclass is not properly initialized. So. Confirming uh, the superclass functionality is sane in an instance of the subclass is really valuable. Um, when you override methods in the subclass, retest the methods in both the super and sub, sub um, and, and subclass. Okay, a further limit is what's called type parameterization. What do I mean by type parameterization? Can anyone say? What's when you pass a general type, so you can sometimes yeah enforces specific type on a class. Okay, there's a certain use to this that I'm I'm having. What's type parameterization? Give me an example of a type parameterized class in Java. A list? Yeah, a list. Because it's not a list. When I first started programming in Java, and you folks were probably not even born. Well, 1994? I was born. 95? Okay, okay, well, my, my hat is off to you. <laughs> Um, <laughs> sorry? 96. Okay. Um, I think it was about, maybe it was 94, 95. In any case, the, all there was was a list. And what was in the list? Anyone want to guess? What would you have in a list? Integers? No, you would have... Nothing? Object. object. References to objects. It was just a generic, well, a generic in a colloquial sense. There's a bunch of objects. That's kind of weird, right? Because in the same list, you might have the first one be a reference to a person, the second one be a reference to a hash table, the third one be a reference to a, you know, a, 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 an app or something like that, all on the same list. But then, as you folks were growing up, the Java library matured. And gosh, when was it? May have been early 2000s. Maybe it was late 1990s. Seems so recent. Um, they incorporated what's called type parameterization or generics. What do, what do I mean by a generic here? It's some. Um, it's a type that gets another type as a parameter. Good. It's it's a type as a type parameter, not not a sort of like a function parameter, but a type parameter. The idea there is just the way like a function takes an argument to do its job. A list needs an argument to do a job. And what's that argument? What's that parameter? It's a type, right? It's a list of something. So you might have a list of persons or a list of hash tables hmm? or a list of apps or an array list of apps, right, et cetera. You've used many of these before, have you not? Even hash tables have them, right? You have a key and value. Hmm? Mm. Now, these are great things. Amongst other things, they made, 
mean that we move beyond just a list of objects, which could be any, each of which could be anything. And we have at least uniformity, right? We have a list of persons. We're guaranteed they're all persons, eh? And there's some confusing stuff involving type erasure and so on. But basically, it's, it's a handy thing. We can count on a certain homogeneity, a certain consistency, uniformity of what's in there. But I would argue that this raises problems for testing. When we have code like this, it raises problems for testing. Why is that? So suppose we implement a mo list. It's a, or a mo array, okay? It's a mo array. Why can't we do thorough testing on it? It's a mo array of some type. You'd have to test it on all these different types. Who knows? Maybe the Mo array counts on its type parameter. So it's a Mo array of X. Maybe it counts on it being clonable. It calls clonable. Or maybe it, or, you know, clone. Um, maybe it, it counts on it being hashable. And it calls that. Maybe it counts on it knowing if it's null, having an is null. Ideally, we'd like to test it with all the things it could be used with, which is a heck of a lot of types. But we can't just say test it with all possible types. We can test it with the types we use in our code, right? But we can't test it with all possible types, which someone might use it. And it could be that one more type, the mo list, will go down in flames. Mm. Mm? Do you see the point? So it gives us great generality, but it prevents us from testing fully what it could be used with. Now, there are limitations in many languages where you can say a MOLIS can only be used with things that support these types of things that implement this interface, for example. And that's a useful, um, a useful thing. Okay. Um, right. Okay. So those are my comments on some general issues um, having to do with testing. I would, ex I would emphasize this value for which Jesse and Mo can confer. If explicitly testing design by contract specification assertions. You test that this thing is true as provided by those specifications to which I look forward in ID 3 and beyond. Okay, um, And it's good to incorporate testing code into a class um, to, subcla to test subclasses particularly well. A lot in um, within the uh, React Native context uses subclassing in the default scheme, right? You have your subclassing of component that's quite basic to the scheme. But Mo has provided a bunch of generic functionality for buttons, for example, which can be subclassed. That's great, but make sure you test, especially where you have any sort of complex functionality subclasses, okay? Especially, especially uh, carefully. So yeah. With yeah. The way that, like, you kind of subclass in JavaScript. Yeah. Um, you kind of use a tag. Would you just, um, like, in a comment, explicitly say, like, I expect the user to give me this? Because it's so generic Correct. that you can give it Correct. anything. Yeah. So no. would I, like, explicitly have a comment saying, I expect this, so test according to this? Yes. Is that how? Yes, um, yes. So you'd be, let, let's be clear, you want someone who uses an instance of your class to know what that class needs to do with, like a method of that class needs to do its job, preconditions, and what it promises in return, okay? Um, and, and so you'd say, you know, you'd need to provide, for example, the first argument needs to be non-negative, you know, or 
it's it's an inch or zero or, or above. Um, I know JavaScript in the form you're using it does not, you know, it, it doesn't support types, right? Yeah. So you can't say it, it, it's an int that comes in, but you can say verbally in the contract, you have to provide an int yeah. that's zero or, or above. So I was looking at the code earlier, yeah. and if you remember the code at the top, I kind of deallocate everything, mm. where like, if you, I like, uh, take it something called a property, yeah. and yep. I take out text yep. and whatever. Exactly. Would I, next to the allocation, say I expect text to be a string, I expect Correct. Is that how I do it? Yeah. If, if it's a, particularly if it's something which is at all in danger of being violated. In other words, there might be some things where just by the structure that's guaranteed by, by the nature of things, um, those things are going to be present. That, you know, you're always going to have a, a name field or something like that. But if it's something the user has to make effort to provide, you're going to want to indicate this has to be provided with these these things. Okay. Yeah. So that somebody uses it, knows. I mean, think think if Austin were writing code against your method, he needs to know what he has to pass to it. He doesn't want to be able, he doesn't want to have to look at all details of your code to figure out what it needs. Like the, oh, somewhere down here, it I needs it. Technically, it doesn't need tech. anything. Oh, it does sometimes. The code will break if it doesn't have certain things sometimes, right? Yeah. Like, okay, so you pass in an int, or you pass in an i, and it returns that element of, of uh, array. It needs it to be non-negative. Yeah, but I'm saying, let's yeah. say that, like, for the button, for example, the functionality. Yeah, no, I get that. If you create the button tag, yeah. and you just create a button tag, yeah. It'll make the like a button on your screen, yep. but I'll have nothing written on it, and I'll have no yep. functionality. Yeah, but you might want to say, for example, this needs to be used with it, because having a button with without a name, so, yeah, so it's not going to be useful. So do I verbally kind of put down the. Yes, okay. you have the option of saying, look, to use this method meaningfully, okay. you have to provide these things, okay. and it's up to the user. To, to do that, but it can be tested by the Jesse code, you know, that it works when it provides these things, right? Um, and in fact, you could put in an assertion which tests that assumption and, and uh, you know, it, it throws an uh, assertion error if it's called without it. To force it into testing. To, to discover any <clears throat> error in the code base. If there's a button that's being created that has no label on it, it's, a problem. it's probably a problem. And you want to know it as soon as possible. You don't want to just overlook it because you didn't happen to see it. You want to, you want to know it, right? Um, and, and so, yes, you want to, you want to find early errors as early as possible, right? Okay, now, I wanted to get back to something that I talked about last time that seemed to be a bit confusing. It was something that I would have hoped would have been covered in uh, 370 or 270 even, but it seemed not to be. Okay, so suppose we have D as a subtype of C, okay? Maybe C is an interface and D is a class. Maybe D is a class and C is a class, either one, okay? Um, so suppose now that we have a class that takes in or sorry, a method that takes in an argument of type C, and it uses C, okay? In other words, it uses an instance of this supertype. You see that? And now we have some other code that creates a D, that's the subtype, an instance of D, and it passes it to foo, right? What does foo th know about C? Does it know it's a D? No, all it knows is that it's a, it's a C. And all it's count, and, and what it's counting on is all the properties of C hood, of when, when it has a C. It, all it knows is that it's a C, and, and it's counting on all the properties of being a C, an instance of C. Okay, so when we have a situation like that, we're dealing with D as a subtype of C. The Liskov substitution principle basically, as a reminder, 
says, look, um, whatever we, whatever properties are true of C, they have to be held for D as well. And we do this not just for fun, because we have to reason safely about types when we have polymorphisms. So suppose we didn't have D adhering to the guarantees of C. Suppose C is known to be always, to have a value, when you say get value, it's always zero or more. And suppose D allows for negative values. Could you imagine this code having problems? Why? Because it doesn't have, it, it explicitly says that you shouldn't have negative values. And yeah. D breaks that problem. That's right. And so this code C may, might be counting on it never being negative, right? Counts on it always being zero or more. And suddenly, if we pass it into something where that's not the case, it could break this code. So when we talk about properties being provable here, I mean things that you could reasonably deduce from the class description, the type description, excuse me, the, uh, the description of the type or the interface of the contract. And, and they need to hold for D as well, okay? So the idea here is, look, we have an actual type that's different from the apparent type. What promises do we need for this, sub, this subtype to, to adhere to, to be used safely? Okay, now, we don't have time the full length of this lecture, so I'm going to have to, um, I'm going to have to talk about this. And, and the example that I used before here, you may remember, is FedEx. Remember FedEx and FredEx? The idea is, look, if you set up as a as a FedEx, and your name is FredEx, you have to adhere to all the promises that FedEx guarantees, because someone could be coming to you with those in mind. They come in, you know, they have to drop off the package by noon and accounting it to be available the next day by 5 p.m., and they come in just prior to noon. And if you say, look, sorry, for our, for our outlet, our franchise, it has to be here by 9 a.m., they could say, look, you're not you're not a real FedEx franchise. You're playing, you're, you're violating the promises I'm counting on for FedEx. But could that customer, could the rules of that FedEx, the FedEx that you've set up, allow for the package to be dropped off by 3 p.m. legitimately? Yes, it could. It relaxes it, it handles a larger set of cases, right? Okay. Um, so we, we talked about this before. I won't hash it, but I would note that there are similar issues uh, in terms of, this is precondition. You can allow for a greater subset of preconditions, but you have to, the pre for all the preconditions that are in place for the superclass, the subclass has to observe them. In other words, it has to handle them. It can't just say, well, the super class handles a certain set of things, but I'm going to punt on those. It has to handle all the things the super class can handle, but it can handle more. And for post conditions, what is it with post conditions? So, so suppose our FedEx, suppose FedEx in general guarantees delivery by 5 p.m. the next day, and our FedEx says, we will deliver not just by 5 p.m. the next day, but by 3 p.m. the next day. Is that okay? You bet it's okay. You actually are providing a guarantee. Is that compatible with what the FedEx provides? Yeah, it's, it lives within the bounds of what FedEx promises. It's just more constrained, it, it, but it's all consistent with what a FedEx can be the case for FedEx. By contrast, suppose we said, look at our FedEx, we only guarantee it by 9 p.m. the next day. Is that okay? No. no, because someone could say, well, wait a minute, that's not living by the rules of FedEx. I came here because I expect to be delivered by 5 p.m. and you're telling me that the rules of FedEx don't apply for your. But if you could make a stronger guarantee, if you say because of our six white boomers, it can be there by within an hour, that's fine. That's fine, right? The customer is not going to be unhappy. Could the customer be unhappy if, if your FedEx says it will take a year because we're sending it on sled dog? Mm -hmm. 
and having them swim in the rivers instead of dragging. Yeah, it could be in command. Okay, so this is a, like a contract hierarchy. The, the FedEx franchise, the FredEx, is the subclass and or a subtype, and the FedEx is the, the super type here. Okay, so what do you have to have here? Mark my words. This is pop quizable. Mm, indeed. I reserve the right to deliver pop quizzes even during tutorial sessions, even at the end of said sessions. Mm. Okay. Um, in terms of testable things here, well, what is this? What are the core layers? This? Well, one thing is you have to have signature compatibility, okay? But it turns out there's two others. So the signature rule is, look, subtypes have to have method signatures that are compatible with subtype, okay? And this is just an extension of that rule for FredEx and FedEx here, okay? Look, the method types can be no more restrictive. They can't rule out, you can't, in a subtype, handle a subset of what's what's handled by the supertype, okay? If the supertype says, I can handle packages delivered till noon, the subtype cannot say, no, we only handle packages if they're delivered by 11 a.m. You've ruled out cases that are legal for the supertype when you're considering the subtype. If FedEx said that, if you walked into FredEx and they said, sorry, you missed the boat, you have to, be, for our franchise, you have to be here by 11 a.m., you could stomp out and say, this is no FedEx, this is a, this FredEx is a fraud, right? Maybe which is why it's called the portmanteau of fraud and FedEx, FredEx, right? Okay, um, so here we can only, by contrast, could we, could the FedEx franchise, FedEx, accept the package till 1 p.m.? And a customer is going to be still happy? Yeah. So it can weaken those type constraints. So, so here, let's, let's take this, okay? Um, so, so imagine that you had a subtype, for example. Um, that uh, that can take in uh, a a string, for example, here. Okay, and I want to have a subtype here that has uh, that overrides that method to take in an object, any object. Is that a legitimate subtype for it to take in any object? If this says you have to give me a string, and this says you can give me an object. I'm not saying this is Java, because actually Java is more restrictive. But if you say, um, if this subtype can handle any object, is that okay? Yeah, it's okay. It's fine. Could someone be mad? They're, they're using one of these instead of one of these. Could they be mad? It doesn't handle the cases I'm counting on from the, from the super cause. No, they can't be. From the super type, they can't be handled. I'm mad about that. And they can't be mad if it handles the string. How if, it, how if the subtype say so I need a double. I don't take no no strings. I'm on a double. That's a problem. That's a problem. It can't even handle the strings, right? So for 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 parameter types, the what's handled by the subtypes in general for those of substitution, it allows more flexibility. It allows a, a larger set of things to be handled. How about for the return values? Well, they can only be restrictions, or in general, for the post conditions, can only be restrictions on what's promised in the super type. In other words, they need to be consistent with what's promised in the super type for the return things, but they can be more specific. So maybe the return value for the, for the super type says that I return an object, and the subtype gives a more specific promise. I return a, a string. It's more particular. That's fine because a string is an object, but you can't have the super type saying I return a string and then the subtype saying I return an object. Why is that? Because if it's going to do anything 
mm. on that string. That's right. And then you return, let's say, a double. That's right. It'll say, like, what the hell? Yeah. I can't do anything on this, right? What, what are you trying to do? You're trying to kill me? Right? Similarly, if this can throw an exception, you can't have the subtype for a checked exception throwing a different exception because someone could say, well, you trying to kill me? I mean, I'm set up to only count on this being the only throwable exception, the only catchable exception, the only one that's, that's uh, declared statically. And suddenly this one saying, I can throw exception two, I'm not set up to handle it. If all I know is it's this, and you give me, and it's secretly this, this can throw a different exception I'm not ready to handle. Again, are you trying to kill me here? I mean, yeah. You can have a very general exception of super class. And yes, be more correct. Okay. You can have a very general exception here, but the sub the sub subtype could throw a very specific one. So maybe this will handle any exception, and this one would would throw only a null pointer exception, right? So, so here you'll notice we have a different type of rule. So for parameters, as we go down the type hierarchy, as we go to subtypes, the methods can take more general things. They can, they can be more flexible. They can be, they handle a broader set of possibilities than the supertypes for method parameters. But for the return values and the exceptions run, and in, 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 in general for the, for the post conditions, it can be more specific. They have to be consistent with those. They can be a subset of the ones that are legitimate for the supertype. They shouldn't surprise, they're among those promised by the supertype, but they can be more, more particular. For example, a particular exception rather than just any old exception, right? Um, or maybe the superclass says, I can return an object, and the subclass says, I always return a string. Fine, a string is an object, that's not a problem. You can't be rudely surprised saying, I was expecting an object if I give you a string. Well, that's an object. That's fine. Mm hmm? Okay. Um, so that's an easy thing to check. And in fact, there are languages which give you this flexibility. Java is currently not amongst them, but there are other languages. Scala, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, gives you some flexibility on this, and there's other languages as well. But it turns out that this is the easy one. The second is behaving consistently, okay? And the rules here are basically similar. If you think of preconditions and postconditions, they follow from what we've just talked about, okay? The idea is, look, subtype methods must behave like, must be consistent with, they must be behaviorally consistent with the respective supertype, the, 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 the corresponding supertype methods, okay? Um, so they can only weaken or maintain the preconditions, and they can only strengthen or maintain the postconditions. And this is the basic rule that we use for signatures. For signatures, we allowed parameters taken in to be weakened. We can handle a bigger set of possibilities. You allow that package to come in by one PM to the FredX. Is that fine? Indeed. So we allow a broader set of things to be handled. We're more generous, we're more able to handle. But you won't be rudely surprised. If you're counting on being able to come in at 11.59 with your package, FredX will welcome it with open arms and place it on the sled, pulled by six white boomers. But maybe FredX says, oh, don't worry about it. 11.59, no sweat. We handle it till 1 p.m. That's fine. You won't be rudely disappointed. You won't claim they're a fraud because they, they handle all what's guaranteed preconditions for FedEx. Similarly, here, you can strengthen post conditions. You can be more specific, but they have to be consistent with the post conditions. They can be a subset of the post conditions promised by the supercut. It's just we're more specific. It's actually this subset that we allow. Postconditions says, you should be prepared for any number to be returned. And the sub, subtype says, I only return a positive number. That's fine, because you're prepared for any number. 
but you're only in the subtype return a positive, right? Or subtype, super type says, I return an, this, this method returns an object and the subtype returns a string, fine, I'm ready for any object and you give me a string, I can handle it, mm, right? Um, okay, okay, um, right, um, yeah, um, so this is the sort of general, the general rule. You know, you don't want to surprise someone where someone drops a package off, they think the FedEx rules applied and they're rudely surprised, right? There should be a no surprise principle here, okay. Now, this is the more complicated one yet, and this is going to take us on a bit of a journey. Subtype interface must preserve provable properties of this, okay? And for both of these guys, we need specifications, we need guarantees, we need contracts, okay. Um, and the two things here, which you may not have seen in previous classes, are invariance and history properties. These are things that can be counted on. An example is, look, if the super type is immutable, what do I mean by immutable? Be Cannot be modified. Yeah, it's read only, it can't be changed. Behavior can't be, it's behavior, it, it cannot be changed in any observable way. We can't, in a subtype, make it mutable because someone could be counting on it not changing in their code. Can you imagine counting on something not changing? You check it once, you know it's true, you don't have to check it again, and then someone passes into you a, 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 a wacko thing that can change at any time. Could your code break? Yeah, the code handling it. Or imagine if you have a super type. All you know is it's a C, but it's actually a subtype D. And the C doesn't have a delete. All you can do is add things to it. Could you be counting on that feature? And if the subtype adds a delete in, it suddenly throws off your code? Yeah, because you're only counting on it staying the same size or growing. And suddenly things start being deleted. The code that's handling this thing could, could break. So let's let's take a look at a few of these, eh? Let's take a uh, look at a few of these. Okay, here's a base type, counter. Good old counter. So you can initialize it, make it zero. You can have a get, and you can have an increment. Get gets its current value, increment increments it by one. Hmm? Okay, here's counter two. It it increments it and uh, and we have a avoid uh, increment. Is this an okay? So if this were a subtype of this, is this an okay subtype of this? Read carefully. I didn't read everything. This increments the value. What does this one do? It doubles the value. Is this an okay subtype of this? If we made this, a, if we said this is a subtype of that one, in other words, this implements this interface, and we, it can be passed around as if it's one of these, could someone be rudely surprised? If I think I have one of these, and I'm using it in my code as a counter, could I be rudely surprised if secretly it's one of these? Yeah. Like what happens? It's like its value is two, and then what happens? I call increment on it, it goes to four. And I say, what the hell? I thought it was one of these, and its value should be three now. But instead it's four. Could you be rudely surprised? Could you be shocked? Could you say, this is not one of these, it's a fraud. It's not one of these guys. So this is not a legitimate behavioral subtype of this one. If you pass this around, you have code that's counting on these features, and these properties, and you give it one of these, it could break that code. Do you agree? Okay. Okay, how about this one? Could is this counter four a legitimate subtype of this counter? If we made counter four, we said counter four implements this interface. And all someone knows is they have a counter, but secretly we pass around one of these that's a subtype of this. Um, its only thing is that it has a, a separate method that doubles the value. Is that legitimate? That's a perfectly legitimate subtype. 
it's not that this is totally rigid. We can't add functionality. This adds functionality. But why doesn't this cause a problem? It's a separate function. If we all we think is it's one of these, we won't even know to call double value, right? It'll behave in all ways like this. If we call increment, it'll keep on incrementing. Good and good and trusty. Now, it's actually more complicated than this. Let's suppose somewhere else in our code base, someone calls double value. You know, we pass it out to another method, and they know it's a counter four secretly. Maybe we don't know in our code, but we pass it, we pass it out to somewhere and, and it calls double value. And then we get it back and continue on. Could we be rudely surprised? Is this a counter that, that has a value now we could never have gotten? Yeah. So suppose it was four and it goes to eight somewhere else in the code base and it's given back to, could we have gotten that by calling increment? Yeah, so it shouldn't shock us. Oh, it's eight. Ooh, we, we might say, oh man, someone must have called increment four times in it. Well, secretly they call double value, but basically it's consistent with all our assumptions, okay? What if we have a counter three, which allows it, so the only difference is it's a constructor where we can give it any old value n, and it will initialize it to this. So we could give it, we could start it not at zero, but we can start at any any integer value n. Could could we be surprised? No. How could we be surprised? Make it less than what it was before. Well, okay, but but this is this is just for the constructor. So so um, we can't call this after it's in operation. So how could we be surprised if we have what we think is a counter? We think we have one of these, but it's secretly one of these. Remember, remember that that first um, that first slide. We we think it's a C, but we actually have a D, right? This is this is the idea, right? Because the we, is, yeah. If if we set it to something that's not zero and we increment it once, people would expect it to be one. Okay. The nature of the counter. Uh, okay. So so well. Um, but okay. So here's this. Could we, so suppose we have a code that's counting on it be a counter. How, how could it be disappointed? Yeah. If you, if you, let's say you initialize a counter in the beginning of a for loop. Yeah. I'm just giving an example where it would break. Okay. And then you make i equal that. So you want to start at zero and go all the way to the end of a list, for example. Yeah. And it, you initialize it and it starts at four. You're missing the first four elements of your list. So. Oh, okay. So that n can be negative. That is the key thing. Uh, because someone could pass in a value. They could pass it. Look, look, the idea is the person who initializes the, this thing, who, who says new of the class, they know what it is. But the question is, if we're dealing with code here that's taking it as an argument, it's being passed to it, it's not a problem if it's four and so on, because we can get that passed to it um, even, if, even if we just have instances of this type. The real problem is if someone initialized it to be a negative value, could we have gotten it through this? No, no way, Jose. We can get it through this. And so someone could say, could look at this interface all day and say, there's just no way. There is no way I can have a negative value. How could this thing be a counter and be negative? And actually, secretly, it's one of these subtypes. It's loosey-goosey. This is not a legitimate subtype. This is a legitimate subtype. This is not a legitimate subtype because it's violating the basic promises. How about this one? This one decrements it. So it, 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 if, is counter five a legitimate subtype of counter? Yes. It, it decrements it as long as its value is greater than zero. Yeah. So it is because it can go negative, so it's always... It can't go negative, good. So it's going from zero and more. But, but if someone has, if they think they have one of these, could they be rudely surprised? Yeah. How could they be surprised? Back. Yeah, this, can this, if you, if you looked at this interface all day, could you imagine any way it can go down no. for a time? No. no, short of integer overflow or something like that, which is infeasible. Um, uh, here, you know, it can't go down. Could this go down? 
Yeah, and so someone could be rudely surprised. Because what the hell? It, it was three. Now it's two. What? What do you mean? How could that? How could it have changed out from under me going negative? It can only increase. Okay. Okay. Here's another example. Here's Connor. Uh, oh. So this is bad. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, bad. Okay, bad. Um, so what you've got to do is you've got to ask, is there any way a user of an apparent class can be rudely surprised, or apparent type, can be rudely surprised by the behavior of, of, of a subtype? Could they be rudely surprised, for example, if the subtype, you know, um, every time you call increment, it doubles the value? Or, or could they be rudely surprised if they're given something that's initialized by this or that the value goes down? Um, could they say, look, this is impossible given the definition. I could never have something that's negative given to me. That can't be produced through this. That's not a legitimate counter. That's a fraud, right? That's what you've got to be looking for here. That's what you've got to be looking for. Um, and it turns out that we can deal with these things um, through providing better specifications. Okay, how about, how about this one? Here's our good old counter. Here's counter two. Is this a legitimate subtype of that? We can reset it. It resets the counter to value n that has to be greater than or equal to zero. No. no. Why not? Because if you're at incremental five and you yeah. reset it and you put yeah. zero, you're going back. Yeah, you're going back. So ladies and gentlemen, what we're talking about here is two things. We're talking about invariance like this austin pointed out this is not legit because there's there's an invariant to this that it's always greater or equal to zero and this violates that this can be negative that's in what's called an invariant it's mark my words this is a very important point an invariant is true at any time any one time you can check the invariant and the invariant i would argue for this there's an invariant that it can only be zero or more you can never get it to be less than zero. Again, ignoring integer over. This violates that invariant. But there's another thing called a history property. A history property, mark my words, is something you can't check at one time. Instead, it's something you check time one and time two, and you compare the values of those two times. Time one occurs before time two. And what's the history property associated with this? Time two is always greater than time one. Yeah, the value of time two can only be greater than or equal to the value of time one. That's a history. Pro Could someone be counting on that? It can. It can never decline, right? That's the way you'd say it. it. Can only stay the same or go up. Does this violate this one here? The last one. Does that violate in invariant? That it's greater than zero? No, it doesn't matter. But it validates the history. The history properties invalidated We're, someone could legitimate i mean look programmers are pretty savvy people you know sometimes you only have so many things you can work with and you, you're really thinking about this algorithm and you're saying this thing can only go up so i can use it i i never have to worry that it's going to overwrite those other elements of the array earlier it can only go up and this this could violate that assumption hmm? in a bad way in a in a way that's bad um, reset the same thing. How about this one? Here's a dual counter. Get this. A dual counter. This, it, it, I say it extends a counter. A dual counter is a counter. You can, you can get it and you can increment it. But it has two counters. And, and get will just get the value of the, the first counter. Increment will increment the first counter. But if you call get two, it'll, it'll give you the second value of the second counter. Increment two will increment that. Um, so, first of all, is dual counter a legitimate subtype of counter? Yeah. It is. It doesn't break it. It offers some great extra functionality. Let's go up substitution principle. It's not about preventing you from having good extra functionality in classes. That's fine. It's just got to be sane functionality. It can't break your assumptions in a way that would be impossible. Violate break code that's using your as if it's an instance of a super class, an instance of a super type. Is dual counter, though, a legitimate subtype? Uh, sorry, is swappable dual counter a legitimate subtype of this? Why not? Because if you increment the first, 
Yeah. So let's say you increment it to three. Yeah. And then you don't increment two, and then you swap them. Yeah. You just broke a history. Yeah, it can go down now. And that's a bad thing, right? Could this go negative? No, but it could violate a history property suddenly because you can swap them, okay? Um, okay, um, here's inset. Ooh, okay, now imagine we have an int bag, which allows and maintains info on multiple inserts. So this one allows us to insert things, to remove things, to ask if it's in, ask about the size, iterate through its elements. Suppose we say, hey, I'm gonna reuse this code. It's gonna give me a lot of good code to reuse. And I'm gonna have an int bag. An int bag is just like this, except if I insert, if I call insert on the same thing more than once, if I say insert one, and you know, if I said insert one and inset, and I said, is it in there? Would it be true or false? Is one in there? It'd be true. Suppose I removed it. Would it be, and then I said, is in, would it be true? No. No, it would no longer be there. But with an int bag, I want to be able to, suppose I call, okay, now suppose on an inset, I call insert on one. It adds it to the elements. It's, it's, a, it's a set of elements. It's a set. Suppose I call insert again on it, and then I call remove. Would it be in there? Does remove remove both, or just the one? That's a set. I don't know, but it, but it remove does says removes X thing. from this, so I'm guessing one only? N no, it turns out if it's a set, it's it would remove both. Yeah. Well, only so one instance. One, uh, yeah. 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 But in, in bag, suppose I want it to, to, I want to override this, so if I insert it twice, it will it will, um, and then I call remove once, it will still have one in there. Could I pass that around as if it's an inset? No. No, because no, someone could be counting on this property. And I'm saying, hey, this int bag is an inset. It ain't, it ain't a legitimate, it ain't a legitimate inset. I'll, I'll leave you with this slide and I will send it to you and I want you to go through there, okay? And uh, I think I'll do, um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do this. Imagine we had an integer bag and we have an int set, and I want to say is integer set a behavioral subtype of int bag, okay? These are highly examinable things. They're also pop quizable things. And I'm a hankering to get some more pop quizzes in. Especially to make sure that you use the tutorial time well with judicious and to make sure that attendance remains good. Okay? Okay. So I'm gonna send you these in email and you can uh, fill them out. Um, uh, but uh, I also look forward to, uh, to enjoying the pleasure of a, of a quiz in coming sessions.